Hello and welcome to Oxygen Delivery and Consumption. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about how we get to the point of having oxygen delivered and oxygen consumed in the body. The first step in the process is that it has to make it into the lungs before it's going to get to the tissues. So of course we have to have good pulmonary function, we have to have adequate oxygen in the air, and all those kind of components to get it to the lungs itself. Then from the lungs it has to get onto the hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin is going to be like the cars on the train taking the oxygen to the tissues of the body. The locomotive of the train is the cardiac output. And then finally we get to the tissue, and if the need at the tissue was for twice as much as we brought, then we're still not meeting the need. So we call this the ventilation perfusion train, and hopefully we're balancing the right side, the tissue oxygen consumption, with all of the components that bring the oxygen to the tissues. So let's take a look at each one of those components a little bit and talk about how we're going to get oxygen to the tissues and how we're going to make sure that our delivery is meeting the consumption. Now we can control many of these different components. For example, if there's not enough oxygen getting to the lungs, we can increase the FiO2. So we can increase the amount of oxygen that is going to the patient. So we could actually manipulate that in some way. Uh, the hemoglobin is a little bit more difficult to manipulate, especially in a patient who is losing hemoglobin because they have bleeding or hemolysis or some other issue that's going on. We'll talk about that one in just a moment. We can manipulate the cardiac output by manipulating our stroke volume or our heart rate. Remember, those are the components that make up cardiac output. So by increasing our preload or increasing contractility, decreasing afterload, we can manipulate cardiac output to try to increase how fast that train is moving. Finally, we get to the tissue level and we can decrease tissue oxygen consumption by decreasing activity and decreasing fever. Those are two of the main components that we have some control over to be able to decrease tissue oxygen consumption. So the one piece of the puzzle here that's a little bit more difficult to manage is going to be the hemoglobin piece. One way to help preserve the patient's hemoglobin is to use something like this. If we have an arterial line in place or even a central line that we're drawing blood from, rather than continuing to have a waste from our blood draw every time we draw blood, what this does is it pulls up, so that little piece that we're seeing there that has the blue bottom and goes up into, it looks like an accordion, you pull that thing up and it draws blood up into that system there. So it's pulling it up into that syringe, and then that port that's uh, the little tannish port that's sitting there is where we draw our blood from, and then when we're done drawing the blood, we push that plunger back down. It will push the blood back into the patient, and then we can flush the line. By this way, we're not having a waste. Now, the waste may seem kind of insignificant when we're only pulling off a few cc's at a time, but over time what happens is that all of those little draws, all those little cc's and mls, may they add up, and we eventually end up having a contribution to our patient's low hemoglobin level. So that, let's back up a little bit and take a look at the lungs themselves and how we're going to manipulate and getting enough oxygen into the bloodstream so that it can get to the tissues of the body. So first of all, we begin with the gas exchange within the alveoli. So we have our gases, we have our oxygen coming down through the airways, it gets down to the alveolus, and then it has to make its way across the alveolar capillary membrane. So this assumes that we have open airways, it assumes that we have an open alveolus, and then it also assumes that, you see that space between the alveolus and the capillary? That's called the alveolar capillary membrane. And that space has to remain clear if we're going to have the normal diffusion of gases across that membrane. So if we start to get some fluid in there, which is the first step that happens in pulmonary edema, we will have trouble moving our gases across that membrane both the diffusion of oxygen and the diffusion of CO2. You may have heard this before, but 
CO2 will diffuse about 20 times better than oxygen. So it'll move across that membrane even though we do have some fluid starting to build up. That's important because even if your patient is developing hypoxia, they may still be able to keep their CO2 levels normal or actually blow off CO2 in an attempt to try to increase their oxygenation because the CO2 diffuses better than oxygen does. Okay, now we got our oxygen across that alveolar capillary membrane and into the circulation. There are a few things that can affect how well we're able to get oxygen down to the alveolus and then into the bloodstream. So if you look at the picture in the upper left corner there, you see we have the blood coming from the pulmonary artery, that's the blue stuff, it goes into the alveolus, both alveoli are completely open and being, and being ventilated, and so we have good perfusion, and you see the red, that's the oxygenated blood coming back to the pulmonary vein. That's a normal ventilation and perfusion that we have occurring in that alveolar capillary membrane in that alveolus. Move over to the right side, we have a situation where we have a low ventilation situation. So you can see that there is an impaired ventilation because there's secretions in that airway in one of those small little bronchi. And so we've got our alveoli collapsing. Now notice what happens with the blood flow. The blue blood there coming from the pulmonary artery, so showing us what the deoxygenated blood looks like, goes right past that alveolus and back into the bloodstream. And therefore the patient is going to have hypoxia. So because we're not oxygenating through those alveoli that have collapsed, we're going to end up having hypoxia. Oftentimes when we see that a patient's blood level of oxygen starts to go down, the first thing we do is to reach for the oxygen and give the patient oxygen. Now take a look at this picture here and think about what's happening. What we're really doing is we're just putting more oxygen in the one alveolus that's completely open and ventilating, but we're not helping the one that is collapsed. So this is where we need to focus our energy. Down in the bottom left, we have a very low shunt. So now we don't have any part of that alveolus that is touching the capillaries. And so we have severe hypoxemia that's occurring. In the next situation, to the bottom right, we have impaired perfusion. So now we have normal alveoli, so they're being ventilated, they're open, they're being ventilated the way they normally should, but we have a blockage in the vascular system. So maybe the patient has a pulmonary embolus that is blocking part of the perfusion. Well, because that area is not being perfused, those alveoli are not oxygenating the blood, and again, we end up getting to the point of having hypoxemia. So let's follow this on through the entire body here so we can see what's happening and where. We have our inspired air, so we're starting kind of at the top left there, and we're going to go down and work our way with the arrows through the patient's vascular system, taking a look at what's happening with their PO2 as it's moving through this system. So we start out with a PO2 of about 159 in inspired air. It gets down into the alveoli, and by the time it hits the actual alveolus, it's at about 104. By the time it gets into the bloodstream, we lose a little bit more, it's down to about 100. So we have a PO2 of 100 in our pulmonary vein that is going to the heart and the systemic system. When it gets down to the tissues, the tissues use a considerable amount of that oxygen and we end up with a PO2 of 40 on the other end of the tissue consumption. Moving back up to the heart, so from the heart and systemic circulation, we still have that PO2 of 40 coming back to the lungs, receiving more oxygen and going back up to 100. Now what happens if there's a problem in that alveolus and we're not moving as much oxygen as we should? Well, we may still have a PO2 of 104 in the alveolus, but if there's a problem in the alveolar capillary membrane, we may only have a PO2 of maybe 80 or 70 that's actually making it through to the artery. So that means when we get down to the tissue, the tissue is still using 60, so we end up with a PO2 on the venous end now of 10. That's coming to the pulmonary vasculature and 
Remember that there's only so much coming through each time. And so each time that blood passes, because it's being deoxygenated further and further, it's coming to the alveolus with less oxygen, and we're not able to completely fill it. And so the level starts going down and down and down until we fix whatever that respiratory problem is. On our capillary network, uh, you know, oftentimes I think we think about a capillary network as just being vessels that go from bigger to smaller to smaller to smaller, and then they get bigger again. Well, actually, they look something like this. And one of the reasons why I show you this at this point is so you'll understand that there can be a shunt that goes past this capillary network. As the patient is starting to become hypovolemic or the patient is becoming hypoxic, some of these capillaries will shut down in order to try to preserve oxygen for the vital organs. So they'll actually shunt blood past these little capillary networks and that's where we start to get ischemia peripherally. Now you may have heard of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve in the past and what happens here is that that PO2, so the oxygen that is dissolved in the blood, is now going to bind up to hemoglobin. So in the lungs, the oxygen diffuses across as PO2. It enters the bloodstream as PO2, and then it binds to hemoglobin and becomes our saturation. This is important because 97% of the oxygen we use at the tissue level is that which is bound to hemoglobin. So we do need to bind oxygen to hemoglobin to be able to perfuse the tissues. There's kind of three steps here that are necessary if we're going to get enough oxygen to the tissue itself. First of all, we need to have the oxygen from the lungs getting to the bloodstream. Next, we need to have that oxygen bind up to hemoglobin. And then thirdly, we need to have that oxygen release from hemoglobin so that it can get to the tissues. There can be situations that will affect this. And that's what we talk about when we talk about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Some of those components are, or the main ones to keep in mind, is going to be the pH, CO2, and then lastly, our 2,3-DPG. So these are some of the main components to be keeping. Now, you can see some other ones here on our chart, talking about the carboxyhemoglobin, the methoglobin, abnormal hemoglobin levels, etc. Okay, so those are all additional components that can affect our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Either side of this curve is not helpful. So look at the left side of the curve first, the increased affinity side. On the increased affinity, it means that the hemoglobin is more likely to bind oxygen. That might sound like a good thing. And in fact, you put the pulse ox on, the pulse ox says 100%. But because it has an increased affinity, it won't let go. We have a higher oxygen saturation on our pulse ox, but that oxygen is not being released to the tissues. On the other side, we have a decreased affinity. So on the right-hand side here, this is a situation where a patient has acidosis or a high CO2, a patient's got a fever. Think about the patients you care for. How many of them have those situations going on? A lot of them, right? There's a decreased affinity, which means less oxygen will bind to hemoglobin in the first place. Now, when it gets to the tissue, it will release more, but it started with less to begin with. So this is also going to cause a tissue hypoxia situation. So if we want to be able to get as much oxygen to the tissues as possible and allow that oxygen to be able to release and get to the tissue to be able to do its work, we need to have this oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve optimized there in the middle which means we need to optimize the patient's pH, the CO2, and the patient's temperature. Once that oxygen gets out into the cells, so here's our red blood cells, and uh, we're absorbing oxygen from the lungs, we carry it down to the cells, and the tissues, and then we need to release it into the cells and the tissues. And we talked about some of those processes that occur with the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. There's a couple of things that will affect how well that oxygen is going to be able to be released and absorbed by the tissue. One is the speed at which the blood is flowing. The slower 
that the blood flows, the more oxygen that will be extracted. Now that may sound like a good thing, and initially it is a good thing, but what will happen over time is that if that blood is moving very slowly through, we're extracting lots of oxygen. That means we're coming to the lungs with less oxygen, and we're not going to be replacing as much. So we're going to start to develop a deficit. If that blood is moving past those cells very quickly, very rapidly, the patient's got a tachycardia, for example, and the blood is moving very quickly past those tissues, we will not have adequate time to absorb the blood. Think about it like that train again. So we have the cars on the train. They're moving very rapidly past the station. People can't get off. We're not going to be able to get people on and get people off if it's moving very rapidly. So we have to slow that down a little bit. And in fact, a lot of times if a patient's got a tachycardia, you may see a drop in the pulse ox, you may see a drop in their oxygenation. And as soon as we slow that heart down, now you start to see it start to increase. The other component that will affect how well our oxygen is going to be absorbed by the tissues is the distance from the inside of the capillary to the tissue itself. So just like we had that fluid building up in the alveolar capillary membrane causing problems with perfusion, here in the tissues we can have the same problem if we're getting edema forming in the tissues in the interstitial spaces. It will create more distance between the bloodstream and the tissue and less oxygen would get across that distance. Once that oxygen does get across that barrier and gets into the tissues themselves, then we're going to have all of these great things happening in the cell itself. So we need to have that oxygen in there to be able to make energy, to be able to run the Krebs cycle, to be able to do electron transport, make all this energy for the cells to be able to run. So all those little brain cells, they need to have this oxygen if they're going to make ATP and if they're going to be able to generate energy to be able to do the function that it's supposed to do. So we need to have that oxygen coming from the lung, getting across that alveolar capillary membrane, binding up to hemoglobin, so we have to optimize those things. Remember, we have to optimize the pH, the CO2, and the temperature, and then we need to make sure there's not too much distance, too much edema, to be able to get that oxygen across into the tissues so the tissues can do all of this great aerobic metabolism kind of stuff. Well, thank you for joining me for Oxygen Delivery and Consumption. Until next time, 